What is up, people? Welcome back to Blue Chip Prospect for another scout. No, <laughs> not another scouting report, but another podcast, another Habs focused podcast. Um, today, I thought it would be cool to take a look at different targets for the Habs uh, with their late first and their most likely late second. Um, not necessarily like jams or something like that, but players that I feel could fall later in the draft. They're still very good value. And, uh, yeah, obviously we we have, like, no clue who's going to be there because, obviously, we're not at the draft right now. Um, and there's still a long way to go before we get there. But the goal is to have fun and the goal is to speculate. So, obviously, you guys might think differently. Maybe there's players that you think would, would be there that I don't think would be there for different reasons. Like, there was players like uh, Parasak and Boivard that I thought... It's not impossible they would be there at somewhere between, uh, let's say, 26 or something like that. But at the same time, I feel like their profile and their production is so high that it's very possible they're also gone. So those are players that I would not put uh, in this list. Also players like, obviously, like if we take a player like Trevor Connolly, the guy is obviously it, like a top 10 talent, most likely. But... With reports coming out of all the issues, like first the, the racism, the the bullying, the the all the teams that he played for. If you, I don't know if you guys read that uh, that athletic article about it, but um, it's not looking necessarily great. But at the same time, it's all speculation. There's no proof of all this stuff, so I don't know. But all I'm trying to say is that it's a guy that is possible that falls on draft day. So. We will see, but at the same time, he's such not a Habs type of target player that I think there's just, even if he was there at, let's say, 25 and we pick 25, I don't think we would be the team to pick him. We already have Mayu that we had to go through all this thing, so I don't think they want to redo that thing and pick a player like Connolly because of those issues, whether they're true or they're not true, it doesn't really matter. I don't think they want to go that way anyway. So anyway, I just didn't put him in the list, even though it's possible that he falls because of all those speculation and stuff like that. So, yeah, I think that's it. So I think we can get this thing started. Uh, first player that I have, and I, I made a setup where I can see everything, so it should be uh, pretty, pretty good this time. All right, so the first player that I have that I hope falls to, let's say, 25 or 26 or whatever, is Beckett Seneca. The guy doesn't have a great production because if I take a look here, he has 60 points in 59 games. It's not, it's nothing impressive. He has 24 goals. He's not the best finisher out there. That is for sure. But the profile of the guy is really good. And he has some skills that are just so good. Like first, the guy is six foot three, maybe even six foot uh, six, six foot two, maybe even six foot three. Right now, he's a right shot, right winger. Uh, he skates really, really well for a guy of that size. Uh, when we look at the ranking, like one of the reasons why I think it's possible that he's there is that there's so many rankings who have him in the second round, and some will have him in the first round, but they're not like high, high pick. Like some of them will have him like higher, but most of them are in the twenties or something like that. So it's a very, it's a very reasonable thought to have him like by the end of the first round and uh, somebody that would be available to us. But uh, yeah, I think that if you can get a guy like Beckett Seneca, who's six foot three, that skates so so well for his for his size. That is just getting into his body from from what I've seen and from what I've heard, he was like five foot ten last year, so <laughs> it's a pretty big growth. The guy has crazy hands. Uh, I don't know if you guys watch the top prospect game, but like the plays that he can make with his hand and how like he can send so many mixed signals and he can just then go everybody one on one. It's probably not the best thing to always go one on one, which is something that he does a lot, but uh one way or another, those hands will help you at the NHL. They will help you make plays. They will help you hide your intentions when you're trying to either shoot or pass it to a teammate. So, yeah, I think, like I said, the, because the production is not really there and there's, like, obviously there's questions about it because if you're that skilled, that big, and you can skate like that and you're still not producing really, really well, there's obviously something that's not working right. But one way or another, I think, like, if he falls 
like I know I know in my ranking I have him uh, later than that, but if he falls to let's say twenty five and we pick twenty five, he's the first guy on the board that I would go pick now. I I just every time I watch him I like him more and more and more, and uh, yeah, just a great profile, great skills, great skater. Uh, when you watch him, you just I don't know. You fall in love with that guy. <laughs> he's just so good. He creates a lot of offense off the rush, and when he's at the when he's at, when they're established in the zone, he has the skills to make you miss. He has the skills to go around you. So, yeah, he's not like the mo- the most competitive player out there. Like he doesn't play the body that much, even though he has a bigger body. But I think it's more the fact that he's not necessarily used to it right now. Like I said, he had a lot of growth in the la- in the in the last year, so it's possible that it just. He's not accustomed to it yet. But other than that, I think that, yeah, just overall, the package of size, skating, hands is really good. And then you just hope for him to explode with his production next year, which is really, really possible. It's, I think for me, he's a prime candidate of a player that could explode in terms of production next year. So if we jump to number two, and at number two, I have Emil Emming. And one thing that I want to say is... Um, like, I, I put them in, in some kind of order, obviously, but I think the order is more important for the, like, the f- first two, three, or four players. After that, it's a lot more murky. You could, <laughs> you know, you, like, it doesn't mean that the, the ninth player that I have list is necessarily at the ninth position. It's just at some point, it, it the, the gap between players is so, so small that you can't really do a ranking that way like you could take any of them and it's, it would be perfectly fine but obviously the first the first two are my favorite then the the third and the fourth are my next favorite and after that it's just a take whoever you want <laughs> so at number two like i said i have emil emming uh he's another big guy and you're gonna see that this is a i'm gonna say it's like a theme that will come back throughout this podcast is that i I'm kind of done with the smaller, the smaller players. Obviously, if it's, if he's extremely skilled or he has something that really really stands out, uh, it's fine. But I think we should try to add size whenever we can. And if you have, like, let's say at 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 29 or at 25 or whatever, I, let's say we're gonna I'm gonna keep saying 25. All right, so let's say we pick 25. You have Beckett Seneke, you have Emil Emming, and you have Michael Misa. Uh, Michael Misa? Luke Misa? Which one? Which one is the one from this year? <laughs> I get mixed up so much between them. Uh, I think it's Luke Misa. Yeah, it's Luke Misa. All right, so if you have the choice between them, in my ranking, I have Luke Misa higher than both of them. But if I if I was the abs, I wouldn't pick one of Emming or one one of Emming or Beckett Seneca before I would pick Misa because we already have that profile in the team and we already have that profile in in the in in the pipeline like we already have like Meshar who's a small very very good skater highly competitive player do we need another one do we need we have Sean Farrell we have uh, Cédric Guindon we have all kinds of small players that could eventually play on the team. And we already have somebody like Newhook. Like, how many of those players do you want? I, I feel like very few is the best. <laughs> so, <laughs> not that I don't like Newhook and that I don't like Meshar. I think they have their, like, especially Newhook. He has a, he has great abilities. He's a, he's a very, very, very good skater. But, like, do you want five of them? probably not <laughs> so that's why like i said you're gonna see that the there's gonna be a team and the theme is gonna be size like a lot of players that i didn't put in there uh like even at five foot eleven like uh who i was thinking of and players that i really like is um what's his name it's Pedersen, but it's uh i don't remember is it lucas Pedersen? yeah lucas Pedersen. I, I thought i like lucas Pedersen, but he's five foot eleven or something like that and i was like no, <laughs> I decided not put it because I want to add size. But obviously there are some exceptions. But anyway, we'll see as it goes. All right. So Emil Emming at number two. I'm gonna try to stop rambling too much so this thing doesn't last for two hours. And I said like nothing. So <laughs> Emil Emming is another six foot two uh, right shot right winger. 
let me open his page to second uh, yeah exactly same thing for him he his ranking is less all over the place like uh, like Beckett Seneca there's no there's basically no ranking where he's in the second round but there's plenty of ranking when he's at the end of the first round so uh, or beginning of the of the second round so I think it's very, it's possible that he's there but if he's there he's such another great profile like I said he's six foot two he plays heavy and he is heavy he's strong on the puck uh, he has an amazing shot like his shot is just not good it's great <laughs> it's very very heavy it's a great shot but it's that's his main that's his main skill right it's not like he's a great playmaker or a great skater with explosiveness and stuff like that he's a shooter he's a guy that gets into position it's a guy that will find the open space get in there and he's gonna release a shot he can release a shot from distance and score he can release a shot in traffic he doesn't need a lot of space to release it uh, he has good hands to make you miss and then release the puck like if he can catch the puck he can he can catch the puck and toe drag it and shoot it right away uh it's very hard to put the stick on the puck when he has the when he has the puck on his stick to shoot it. But he's not a playmaker. He's not the guy that's gonna be there and gonna try to make plays for other. He's the he's a player that plays without the puck, gets into position to then shoot. And he has a very strong and heavy shot. And he has the brain to understand where he should be, how he should play. Um, wait for the right opportunity to hide himself and f find a pocket of space, jump into it for a quick second, take a shot, get out, get out of there. So yeah, and outside of that, he's also a competitive player. He's not like, um, I wouldn't say he's, he's, he's a physical player, but he's perfectly capable to play heavy and uh, use his body to shield the puck. He's very capable to use his body to separate player from the puck on the cycle. Uh, it's very different in Liga. When you watch it, it's not it's not the same type of hockey, and it's also very boring. But that's another thing. It's but I feel like his game really translates well to North American game. Like it's less good in Liga, a bit like if you take Slavkovsky, the way he played, you knew that this type of play is more North American. Well, it's a bit the same thing for Emil Emming. I'm not saying to the same extent, and I don't. I don't he's not as good on the board. He's not taking the puck from the outside to the inside all the time like Slavkowski used to do in his in his uh, in his draft here. But he still has competitive competitiveness. He still gets to the middle to shoot the puck as much, uh, not all the time, but quite a lot, I would say. And like I said, he has the brain and the shot to get into position and release a puck. And sh and he, the shot is really good so he can shoot from mid-range he can shoot from long range and still score because he has a very heavy and strong shot so yeah if you pick a guy like emming like i said you get a guy that's that's heavy you get a guy that is big you get a guy that is not the strongest skater and uh, needs work like i said especially in the explosiveness department of his skating like the, the i think the speed over a certain time is fine it's more like get the quick acceleration, the quick burst to get into position. That that will be the main issue with his skating. But like I said, six foot two guy with a great shot and decent skating, but not very explosive. And the brain to get into position, you get a very good pick at uh, somewhere like twenty five. So I think it's really good. And at number three, I have Michael Egg or Michael Age. <laughs> <laughs> I never know how to say his name. Uh, the guy is another one. He's a center. He's six foot one, and even though he's just six foot one, he's another guy that plays heavy. And like I said, that's another team that's gonna come. It's not just it's not just the size. It's also the way they play. I don't want to play. Like it's okay if you're six foot three, but if you're six foot three and you're you're soft like uh, like paper, then it's like there's really no point but if you're six foot one and you play heavy and you're heavy on the puck and nobody can stick with you because you put your weight on it and you you go into the corners and you go on the board and you battle and you win your battles and you get body positioning or you go in front of the net you get to the middle all the good stuff that you can do when you play with strength and, and have the body for it well those are the kind of attributes that i'm looking for and the kind of attributes that i think the haves need to focus a little bit more on so yeah michael age uh six foot one center uh, amazing skills a bit like like seneca i would say he has 
crazy good hands. He's a crazy, not a crazy good skater, but he's a, he's a very good skater. <laughs> crazy good. Let's calm down a little bit. Uh, yeah, so <clears throat> same thing as, as Seneca. He uses his hands to make all kinds of play and to hide his intentions, whether he's going to be uh, shooting or whether he's going to be passing. You kind of never know with him. He's not looking where he's going to go, and he can absolutely use his hands to make you miss all the time. He creates a ton of offense on the rush. Uh, I think he's more... It's one of the things that I would like to see him a little bit more is to create more plays once they've settled in. Right now, he's more like a, a rush creator. And obviously, that works, but it's like 50% of the work. There's another 50% of the offense where the team have established themselves and you have to learn to uh, protect the puck and find the space to send the puck into or read the plays to anticipate where your players are going to be and send the puck there. You know, so... It, that's the that's the part that's a bit uh, not as good for now, but like I said, he, he's a he's a good he's a good playmaker. He has a good shot. He creates a lot on the rush. Good skater. Uh, he lost a year of development last year because uh, he was injured. I don't remember what the injury was, but he was injured pretty much all of last year. And I mean, it it's kind of good because the the guy comes back now he's an april birthday so he's not like he's an old guy in the, in the in the draft he's pretty young and he comes back after a year of injury and he's just destroying the ushl he has 61 points 28 goals in 46 games so <clears throat> really good overall production and he has the body to go with it and you when you look at him play you see all the skills that he has you see the playmaking you see the creation of the rush you see the 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 very good skating you see the hands that are really good you see the heavy shot so he has a little bit of everything he drives the middle of the ice consistently basically night after night he always plays in the middle he understands that this is where he's going to create offense like he's not a it's not like a hockey brain so unless you're a player that's extremely skilled and have that that elite or high in hockey brain you have to get to the middle to create offense or to shoot the puck if you stay on the perimeter even even the best of them sometimes on the perimeter it's not good enough you need to get to the middle of the ice it's even one thing that suzuki said this season is that he's working on making every play end up in the middle of the ice because this is where the offense comes from so i think it's the same thing with michael age he likes to play from the middle so that's a very good thing to start with and like i said he's another player that likes to play heavy he's not necessarily a physical player but he's another play and it's another player that uses body to shield the puck that uses body to gain body positioning and win his battles and i think he wins most of his battle along the board which is a very good thing even though it's just the ushl it's still a good thing to have those habits to get the body to put your leg in front of the other player or put your place your hips in front of him so you have the better body positioning to win those battles so yeah, it's always a great advantage, and when you can, you know how to use your body and you know how to use your skills, it's much better. But like I said, uh, overall, the profile is basically like the other two. He's a big guy, plays heavy, with a ton of skills, good skater. Uh, well, Hemming is not, <laughs> is not as much a good skater, but he's still a decent skater. But they all play heavy, they all have a good shot, and they all have, they're all like, have all kinds of skills, all right? At number four, I have John Mustard. <laughs> what a cool name. Uh, the guy, another guy that's six foot one center, and another guy that plays heavy, another guy that will use his body to get to the middle, use his body to shield the puck, cut to the net, another guy that will go to the board and drop that will go to the board and win his battles, another guy that goes in the corner to get the puck on a dump and chase, another guy that just gets to the middle of the ice a guy that pushes the pace a guy that not not just pushes the pace the guy is a tremendous skater he's not just like he's not just playing fast he's just a better skater than most of them in the ushl anyway so let me just open his page for a second so i can see his stats <clears throat> yeah all right so uh right now on the season he's not as productive as uh michael age like i said michael age is 61 points 28 goals in 46 games on john in john mustard's case he has 46 points 23 goals in 48 so he's basically a point per game michael age is has better production uh but i think that john mustard has 
overall, he has the better shot and the better skating. Even though I think Michael Edge is, is a more complete player in the way he plays, and he also has a better like two-way efficiency, or is that how we say that? Anyway, he's just a better two-way player than John Mustard. I think John Mustard has the more offensive ceiling, if you like, because his shot is really, really good, and his skating is extremely good. It's not just very good. It's very, very, very good. <laughs> but like another guy, like I said, he's six foot one. That plays heavy. Goes to the middle of the ice to make his plays. He's not really another one that's not really the best playmaker out there. Like uh, Emming, his his job. Not that it's it's not his job. It's more that it's not his style of play. He's another guy that will. He, the the difference between him and Hemming is that Emming. Is a guy that, like I said, will wait for the opportunity, get into position. He plays without the puck. He's a better player without the puck. So he's not necessarily a driver. John Mustard is is different in that way that, yes, he can do all that. He can get into position and to shoot to shoot a puck. He has a good one-timer. He has a very good wrist turn snapshot. But he also drives the play. He also likes to have the puck on his stick. He loves to handle the puck, transition the puck, get the puck to the middle and drive or beat the defender out wide and get to the net. He just he has the shot for it and he has the skating for it and he has the the drive, the competitive drive and the the just a com- like a competitive player, right? So he's a is a great profile with a lot of great skills. He's not like all those players, they're players that will probably project more as middle six player. Like it's hard to say a player that has forty six points and forty eight games as a future top six player. Like obviously, there's always that type of potential when you can shoot the puck like he does and you can skate the way he does. Man, you have that body profile and the way that he plays. But those players all project more as probably middle six more than top six. But there's always that off chance that he could turn into something like that. But when you pick at 25, you get whatever is left. And whatever is left is mostly bottom six, middle six, with some chance to play in the top six. But you try to get players that still have skills, you know? Like, it's one of the things, like, when they pick, let's say, Owen Beck. I think it was 33rd they took Owen Beck. Owen Beck didn't have any skills that was that could project him as a top six player it like if you compare him to a player like john mustard or your michael age or beckett seneca or emil emming he doesn't have that shot at all he doesn't have the hands he has basically has no hands <laughs> no and he's not like josh anderson but it's like it's not it's not that far off but like he's a good skater he's a okay playmaker he can put the puck under sticks for from other people and make make short plays that are good plays he's good at face off he's good defensively but nothing project him as a as a top six player like there's basically there's always a chance but there's basically no chance that he's going to be a top six player all those players that i'm talking about now are players that have a chance to because they have a skill that can be projected to into a top six or at least a player that if you put in the top six it's not going to hurt your team so I'm more that type of person. I, I don't look for a player that will play necessarily the more complete game. And I know that will play on my third line or my fourth line or whatever. And he's going to do one thing very well, like taking face off, for example. I'm not that type of evaluator. I always try to look for a skill or at least a couple of skills that can translate into into the, the lineup, higher in the lineup. But also has that type of body and that type of play that you can easily project into a bottom six. So those players usually will end up into a middle six. So yeah, so John Mustard, six foot one, plays heavy, competes hard, win battles, tremendous skater, push pace, drive middle, beat the, <laughs> can beat the D's out wide, hard and heavy shot. All right, that's basically the, that's basically the way it goes. And after him, this is where, like I said, I think the rest of them are. Like, you can take any one of them in any order, and I wouldn't mind at all. They're all on the same level to me. So, and we start that level with Yegor Surin. I don't know if any of you saw him play, but he's a treat to watch. Uh, he's the type of player that I think will be, like, a fan favorite 
sometimes we think that but it doesn't work like I, w I was thinking that with the the Vasily Pod Podkolzin, Podkolzin? <laughs> the the guy from uh, Vancouver because in his draft year he was so intense and so competitive yeah obviously he has skating issues which were big issues but he had offense and he but he was such a competitive driver that I thought that guy would for sure be a team favorite like would at worst he would be like a, a third liner but most likely in the top six but also a player that would like just be so competitive along the board and in the corners and in front of the net that people would just love him but he's not doing much so it's, it's hard to be it's hard to be the a fan favorite when you don't do anything so yeah so anyway so at number five Yegor Surin is another one who's six foot one center another guy who plays heavy <laughs> he's a player that's also very physical compared to the other one who I said plays heavy but more in a way that the way they protect the puck and the way that they win battles and get body positioning or go in front of the net and all the good stuff uh, Igor Sorin is different in a way that he's also very physical he's not just trying to win pucks he's not just trying to get in front of the net he's not just trying to use his body to shield the puck and get to the middle of the ice or in the, close to the crease or something like that he's a player that uses his body to hit you <laughs> and hit you hard he obviously it's a bit of a problem also it's not just positive I, I love to see it. I love to see players who are physical it's a brand of hockey that I love. It's a brand of ho a hockey that, that wins. But it's also sometimes when it's too much, it's too much. If you guys think about players like uh, like Jack Eye right now, but right now he's doing better. But before when he was always getting out the play because he was trying to hit player. I remember last year when he went deep into the zone to hit a player to protect Slavkovsky. Like, you can't do that in the NHL. You have to control yourself. On a losing team, it's different, but on a team that's trying to win, you cannot do those th those type of thing. And Yegor Surin right now is a bit like that. He's a bit the type of player that is a little bit all over the place physically, but like you'd rather see that than see a guy that doesn't compete, right? Because because you can always try to calm him down instead of trying to tell the other guy that. Yeah, you should try to do something sometimes. <laughs> so, yeah, but he doesn't have only that. Obviously, he doesn't have only the 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 body at six foot one and the very physical, extremely competitive player. He's also <clears throat> he has good skills. He's a good passer. He has a great shot from distance. He's a great skater. Not not a great skater. He's a good skater. Let's not exaggerate with a great skater. Uh, one of the thing though is that he plays in the MHL and it's. It's getting a bit hard to evaluate the MHL. Like, what level is it exactly? Like, when you have a player like Ivan Dimitrov who's producing three points a game sometimes, like, what is the level of the MHL right now? It's definitely under the CHL. Is it under the USHL? Like, what is it? Ah, it's really hard. So, anyway, the guy has 52 points, 22 goals in 42 games. Uh, in the MHL for local Yar Yaroslav, and he's been he's been tremendous. <laughs> he's been very good on the team. Like I said, it's not just about the body and the physicality of his game; it's also the skills that he bring. Like if you if you take his profile, you have a, a big guy, plays heavy, competes hard, and have a lot of skills. So it's hard to see that guy not playing the NHL. Like this is the type of profile that if if you subtract the skating and you see that guy has a subpar skating, then you it could be harder. But if you add the fact that he's also a good skater and, and he has the skills to be a good passer and a good shooter and he brings it shift, shift after shift, then you have a guy that will most likely play in the NHL. Okay, right now he's in Russia and it could be harder. <laughs> we don't know. But... Um, yeah, like I said, I just think that he's really good. And right now, in the playoffs, he's been tremendous also. Like, he, he has 10 points in four games in the playoff. He played four games against, uh, what's the team? It's uh, MHK? Yeah, I think it's MHK, something like that. He played something around 15 minutes per game. And he, he made, like I said, 10 points in four games. So... <laughs> that's really good it's still it's the MHL but when you have a guy that can produce like that in the playoff 
with that, that type of skills and that type of physical presence and competitiveness and the body, it's really good, right? So that's the type of pick that you want to do at the end of the first or in the early seconds or something like that. So Yegor Soren at number five, a really fun player to watch. And if he makes it, and he makes it in a way that is not just as a fourth line player, I think he's going to be a fan favorite for whoever picks him. Maybe the Habs. We'll see. After that, uh, it's it's not just one player. It's like a trio. <laughs> it's the trio of big defensemen that I kind of all like equally. Those players are Adam Kleber, and there there's Charlie Ellick, and there's e- E.G. Emery. I I used to prefer Charlie Ellick out of out of those. But I feel like he's sometimes so all over the place. <laughs> it, like even in my ranking, I had him at the end of my ranking. Now he's out of it right now, but he's he, I had him at, I think at 31st or 32nd, I don't remember. I don't have it in front of me. But he was at the very end of my ranking. Now he's not there and EJ Emery is not in there too, but maybe Adam Kleber could get there. It's not impossible. The thing is, like, out of those three, he's the worst, he's the worst skater, in my opinion. Adam Kleber is a good skater for his size, but he's not necessarily a good skater. If you take Charlie Ellick and E.G. Emery, they are a better skater than, than, than Adam Kleber by a fairly good margin. But Adam Kleber is six foot five, and he's also the most offensive of all those. Like, they all have, like, not great point production like Charlie Alec if I go take his page to second let me open this sorry if it's low that's low back uh, he has 26 points in 62 games in the WHL so obviously it's not fantastic if we take EG Henry let's wait a second he has five points no goals in the USHL and overall 10 points no goals in 47 games for the NTDP overall. So, even worse. <laughs> but he's the best defensively, though. Of all those, he's the best defensively. And if you take Adam Kleber, he has 19 points in 44 games for the Lincoln Stars in the USHL. So, not a great production also. It's close to half a point per game. But if you take the production aside... Is the only one that you can see some type of offensive production in the future. Like, it's clear that Charlie Ellick and E.G. Emery are going to be shut down defensemen. They're going to use their skating. They're going to use their physical gift and their competitiveness to shut players down uh, before they reach the blue line and just shut the place. They're going to be play killers. And they're going to play, like... It's, it's hard to see a world where Charlie Illick and A.J. Emery don't get a chance at the NHL to prove what they can do. Right now, Ch- Charlie Illick is a bit all over the place defensively. He gets lost very easy. When things start to move around him, he loses his assignments. A.J. Emery is a bit better at that. I think he's the best of one, the best of them defensively, but he's also very, very uh, meh <laughs> offensively and on the breakout. Adam Kleber is like a mix of all this. Like, he's not the best defensively. He's also not the best skater out of them. He's the worst skater out of them. Without being a bad skater, he's just good for his size. But offensively, like, first he has a good puck. He has a good breakout. He's getting, Obviously, with that kind of range, he's, it's easy for him to, at least in the USHL, to create separation from the first four checker and just send the puck to the neutral zone. So... And in the offensive zone, he's capable of moving moving along the line and create lanes for passing and for shooting. Even though he's not a hard shooter like whatsoever, in my opinion, he still has five goals, so it's not that bad. He can put the puck on net. It's just that he's not a hard shooter, but he's a decent passer and he's also a, a decent brain in the sense that he understands how to create some offense. So, at six foot five, if you can skate good enough for a guy of your size you have that kind of reach you play well defensively and you can also break the puck out and have a good first pass or play in the offensive zone like he's never going to be a first power play type of guy that's obvious but you still have decent enough skills to create some kind of secondary offense which i can't say for charlie alec and i certainly can't say for eg emery so all of them 
all mostly project as more shut down type of player but uh, Adam Kleber has a better chance to also produce some type of offense so all of them even though Charlie Ellick and AJ Emery are the better skater I think I would go with Adam Kleber I think he's my favorite out of them but that changes quite often <laughs> but it's just like I like I, I like shut down defense uh, defense is extremely important to me when I evaluate a player skating is also extremely important but if if it's all that you've got it's hard to you know if 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 there's no world where we can see a, a top four player because he just can't break out the puck and he can't do anything in the neutral zone or the off offensive zone and sometimes you break out you, you keep breaking out the puck to uh, the board because you don't you just don't have the the skills to break it through a, a pass right well then it's I think it's too limiting so Adam Kleber would be my choice between those three but I think they're all significant not significantly good but like they're all decent pick uh, for a pick 25 let's say after that I have Madve Gryden Gryden <laughs> man names is the hardest thing Madve Gryden 6 foot 1 forward uh, another guy that is very skilled he has great hands great passing skills he has a devastating shot like offensively it's really good he's better with the puck than without the puck i don't think he's the type of guy like i said like hemming that is really good at finding the the open space and getting into those space to release a shot and something like that he's more the guy that wants the puck on his on his stick and same thing defensively he's uh not great <laughs> it's, it's, it's the way to put it i don't think he works hard at all defensively right now obviously those are all things that can be fixed with time they're all things that Every team, I'm going to tell them to work on it. Now, it's going to be on them to see if they have the will and the competitiveness to actually work on it. But still, if you get a guy that is six foot one, 185 pounds, uh, he doesn't necessarily play that heavy, I would say, compared to the other one. Like, like I said, the theme is you play heavy, but this guy is a bit like out of that. But in terms of skills, like I said, with a shot like that, with the hands that he has, uh, I think it's uh, overall offensively he's very good. That's what I'm trying to say. He's like, is that he's a good passer? He has the devastating shot that I said. He also have the great hands. So offensively, to create offense, he has the full package. One of the things that I would like to see is probably to see him play with a little bit more pace, push the pace, try to push the defenders back to create space for yourself and for your teammates, which he doesn't really do all that well. But one way or another, the guy still has 69 points, 30 goals in 51 games. So... <laughs> in the USHL so it's it's hard to argue the production right you look at the production you look at the skills and you're like mm, good chance it's gonna work but at the same time uh, the skating is not it's not necessarily the skating I think the skating is like average it's, it's not it's not necessarily an issue uh, the issue is the pace at which he plays with which it's something that we can say for many many players but some players work on it and some players don't work on it if you take suzuki for example he was a bad skater in his draft year but he worked on it worked on it worked on it and then he worked to and once his skating was a little bit more advanced he worked on playing with pace and playing while his feet kept moving and not just always stopping to make your plays or always trying to make plays while while the team is established in the zone or something like that like trying to push the pace and make plays while pushing the pace this is what the offenses in the NHL most of the time so you want your player to be able to do that but uh, right now Matt Begridden doesn't do that but he has the skills to be able to do it now it's about can he wire his brain to be able to do all this at the same time because like I said he has great hands he has great passing skills and he has a devastating shot but now can he take those three skills and put them at the same time as he's moving his feet that will be the like that will be the limiting factor whether he plays in the NHL or he doesn't play in the NHL or if you have any kind of significant impact or if he doesn't have impact at all because I don't think he's the type of player that will play in the bottom six obviously if your team is competitive and you're pushing for the for the Stanley Cup and you have that guy on the entry level 
uh, contract and he and he can play, you you'll play him just like let's say uh, L.A. with Arthur Kaliev. He, he doesn't bring much, <laughs> but they're playing him because it's a cheap contract and it's, it's a player that you want him to get better because he has the skills to get better. So he has to work somewhere. He cannot always be in the AHL if the guy is NHL level. So it's a bit the same thing with Matt Vigridden. It's a uh, like he has he's going to have to play at some point. And uh, maybe he will bring something, maybe he won't bring something. It depends if he use if he's capable of using his skating while trying to create offense. And he's going to have to work on his defense to make sure that he brings that to an acceptable level to the NHL. Did it make sense? I think it did. So, yeah. After that, after Matt Vigrinen, I have... <laughs> I don't really want it. It's more that... Yeah, I don't know how to say that. It's more that... Look, after that, I have Cole Hudson, and it's not like it's a player that I want. Like compared to Lane Hudson in his draft year, I wanted Lane Hudson. I I had Lane Hudson in my top fifteen, and I wanted Lane Hudson on the team. I wanted Lane Hudson with our with our late first. Cole Hudson, it's not that I want him because we already have Lane, even though they're like different in some ways, but I would do it. Like if. If all of the four first guy, if all of John Mustard, Michael Age, Emil Emming, and Beckett Seneca were gone, uh, and they don't like Edgar Sermon, they don't like Adam Kleber or A.G. Emery or Matt Vigridden or Charlie Ellick, and they would go with Cole Hudson, I'd be perfectly fine with it. Because Cole Hudson, no matter what people say right now, because he's still a small defender and he's still not... He's not as impressive as his brother right now. He still has crazy skills. And he's still a much, much, much better skater than his brother. So one of the main difference, you know, when you watch them, and especially if you watch them at the U18s last year, it was so evident that they play, like, they play such a similar game. It's crazy. Like, all the time I think about Lane Hudson, and I'm like, I don't, I don't, there's nobody that I, can, that I see in the NHL that plays that way. So it's hard to see, is it going to work? Is it not going to work? And one of the problems with Lane Hudson is that he can make miss. He can make you miss all he wants. He can create so many misdirections in half a second that you don't know where to go. And you will miss your puck on stick. You will miss your body positioning. You will miss your, your coverage. But he doesn't have the, the legs. He doesn't have the feet to explode out of that little gap that he created and create a bigger gap to make a play. Or he has it sometimes at the NCAA level, but not all the time. Sometimes on the breakout, it doesn't work at all. He goes behind the net, he makes one spin, another spin, another spin, and then the little gap that he created from the from the player by spinning so much, well, he gets caught up by the, by the player after and he loses the puck because they just pin him on the board and he couldn't gain enough speed or separation to actually make a play with what he created. That's the difference with Cole Hudson is that he plays the same way in the way that he sends a million misdirections in one second, but he also has the legs to explode off of it. So even though I have him lower, and I have him lower because we already have Lane Hudson, and I and I think he's also less like he's been less productive and he's less impressive at the at the NTDP level right now, but I wouldn't be surprised if Cole Hudson work and Lane Hudson doesn't work. For that reason, because even though they play a very similar game in the fact that they can create a million, a million mis- misdirection in, in one second, Cole Hudson can explode off of it while Lane Hudson cannot do that. So it's going to be interesting to, say, to see uh, at the very least. Also, Cole Hudson is extremely young. Let me open his page to a second. He's, yeah, he's a June birthday. He's a June 28th birthday. So he's very young in the, in the draft. So this help him it's it's always a positive for him obviously the, the season was up and down in terms of offensive production and in terms of uh, the way he plays but defensively even though i think he's not as smart as his brother i think he's a more physical more uh, in your face type of defense in the way that he sticks to his assignment like he will play very, very close and try to disrupt as much as he can with his stick, with his body, with anything that he has. He just doesn't let go. While Lane Hudson is more like a, a controlled gap 
type of uh, type of player. But if <laughs> if if the player coming down the wing is making him pivot, then it's possible that it doesn't work. <laughs> I think I think he's getting better. He's like, this is supposed to be about Cole Hudson, and I talk I talk more about Lane Hudson. But anyways, like it's getting better with Lane Hudson. Is is he? It's not true that he's horrible at pivoting anymore. He's, he he can do it. It's just it's not it's not fantastic. It's not fluid. It's a, it's hard for him to go forward, pivot backward without losing speed. That's the issue. So he get he can get he can get turned by by wingers or centers coming down the wing, and just trying to beat him out wide. It's not hard to beat him out wide. His brother, it's very different. Because he has the skating to recover, but Lane Hudson, the, now the way he adapts to it is that he just he control his gap instead of playing so close to you and trying to push you necessarily just out wide. He just controls the angle, he controls the gap, and like this, even if you make him spin, he still has uh, a little separation where he can try to recover. So it's getting better and better. And Cole Hudson is that because he's such a significantly better skater. This is not going to be a problem, but he also, like I said, plays so differently in the defensive zone in a way that he just takes on you and he just plays close and try to be as disruptive as possible and not give you space. While Lane Hudson gives you space, Cole Hudson doesn't give you space. Like I said, he's also more physical, but it's he's still a five foot ten defenseman, right? So physical or not, it doesn't it doesn't matter. <laughs> it doesn't matter at all. But on the other hand, like I said, offensively. It's the same thing. I don't think he has the same type of brain as his brother. I don't think he has the same vision. He has the same skills in the sense that he, the hands and the fakes and shimmies are at the same level. Like Cole Hudson and Lane Hudson plays an identical type of type of game offensively, but Lane Hudson I think has a better vision and a better understanding and maybe even a better passing skills in the way that once he created a little gap he has that ability into half a second to send the puck cross ice to a player waiting for it for a one timer or to a backdoor tap in. Cole Hudson, he has it, and you can see it often. You saw it a lot at the U, at the U eighteen last year, but even this season, you saw it that he can that he can do the same thing, but it's not as consistent as consistent, and sometimes he miss some reads. So I think maybe. The, the the IQ is not at the same level, but at the same time, like I said, he has the explosiveness in his legs to give himself more time. So while he learned to work with that time, like Hudson, Hudson Lane doesn't have the time to work with. So he has to have that vision and that understanding that he needs to send the puck right away somewhere. Uh, Cole Hudson will have more time because once he spins off the the pressure, he will be able to gain even more separation and have a little bit more time to make his play. So maybe in the end it all equals out. We will see. But like I said, Cole Hudson, I, w- I would honestly I would be excited to have him on the team just because he's the brother and he's like the same player. It would be kind of. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, like let's say we take uh, somebody like. Berkeley Catton uh, with the seventh pick and Cole Hudson with the twenty fifth pick. Uh, it's a lot of skills injected in the team, but it's a it's a bit of the, on the redundant skill with Cole and Lane. But I'd be happy because that's exciting, very exciting, but not ideal. <laughs> All right. Uh, after that, after Cole Hudson, I have Maxim Mossy. Uh, let me open his page. Maxim Marse is let's go open. All right, got it. So Maxim Marse is a six foot two right winger. Uh, I don't know why on Elite Prospect it says six foot one, but I read I don't remember where six foot two. I don't know where, but anyway, I saw six foot two. So Maxim Marse is uh, how can I say that? He's like he's like Emming, who works harder, but worse skating. <laughs> like even though like I said Emming is not a great great skater like he lacks the explosiveness to get into the gaps uh, quickly well M- Masi just lacks a little bit of everything in the skating department he likes the speed he likes the explosiveness and he likes the agility it's not he's not like an extremely subpar skater that's not what I'm trying to say it's just that he's under average in my opinion and it's gonna need 
a significant amount of work to make it work. But at the same time, you look at players like uh, Joshua Wa, <laughs> who is not a great skater, and he's making it work really well at the NHL level. And but he has he has a great brain. He really understands space and time, and he has a great shot and everything. So Maxim Marse could maybe make it work in that way, but I don't think he has the same type of same type of IQ, same type of um, of uh, hockey sense. Even though he's still an incredibly smart player, uh, yeah. So anyway, Maxim Marse, six foot two, right winger. Uh, like I said, the shot is the main skill. It's uh, basically that's how he's gonna create the most at the NHL level if he gets there. He has 67 points in 63 games for the Shikutsimi Saguenay and 31 goals. So he scores a lot, and like I said, his shot is the main uh, is the main skill, the main attractive thing on him because he has good hands. He understands how to keep the puck away to release his shot and stuff like that, but. He's, he is not a great playmaker. He is not necessarily a gifted passer. The skills for passing are not great. Like they're 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 good. They're they're okay. It's not like he's gonna miss all of it, all of his passes, but he doesn't necessarily have the vision. Like his vision is a more like I don't know. How you say that in English, but you know, like when the, those horses when they have the thing between their <laughs> on the side of their face to make them look in front of them. That's a bit what Maxim Mossy is to me. He, he, he looks in front of them, and what's in front of them is often the net. <laughs> so he just shoots the puck at the net and doesn't really look if there's an open teammate for a better chance or something like that. Obviously, he does it sometimes, and he does it at the QMG, QMG, QMG HL level. But I don't think at the next level it's going to work. I think he's going to be a primary shooter and that's what he's going to bring. Now he's going to have to work on his on his skating to actually get into the position because he's that's the thing at the NHS that if you want to shoot, you have to not stand in the open gaps. You have to let them open and then jump into them to create to, to make to, to shoot the puck right or if you stand in them you're gonna have a defender on yourself and then the gap is gonna is gonna close so you have to find ways to be forgotten and then jump into the gaps but jump into the gaps at the NHL level because the play is so quick and the puck moves so fast you have to be able to get there quickly or you have to be able to get there before the defender who's watching you so that's where Maxim Massé has a little problem, but I think that he's very good at identifying those gaps and those and those plays. He's very good at reading the play and anticipating where to be and where the, the gaps are going to be created and where to go to shoot the puck. He just doesn't necessarily have the skating to do it at the next level right now, so he has to rely on his position. And uh, yeah, that's it. Outside of that, he doesn't play with a lot of pace, in my opinion, because of the skating issue. He doesn't win a lot of races for the puck, so he's not he's not often first on puck. Even though he's he, he works hard and he works he works hard and he's competitive and he's trying to get to the pucks because he when he gets to the puck, he wins most of his battle. The problem is that if it's a if it's a race and they start from the same point he's gonna lose that race more often than not so that would be a problem right now and like i said it's gonna be the main thing for him to focus is to get stronger in his legs if you can't get faster at least get stronger it's gonna help you so yeah but one way or another very good shot good hands works hard plays heavy <laughs> So I feel like I said that a hundred times, but uh, skating is gonna need a, it's gonna need some work. All right, so that was it for Maxim Marseille. After that, it's uh, again it's like two players that I mixed together. Not that they're the same, but they're the same type of defenseman if you like, but they're still quite different. And those two players are Alphonse Frey <laughs> and Henry Muse. Uh, Alphonse Frey is a like they're they're both around the same the same size, but Fry is six foot one and uh, Muse is six foot. They're both offensively minded defensemen. Uh, maybe Muse a little bit more. He's more chaotic. Fry is a lot less chaotic in the way that he plays. Obviously, he will get out of he will get out of position. Sometimes he will go deep into the offensive zone and miss 
and miss something and then you can't get back because uh, you just ventured <laughs> too deep into the zone. The thing with Muse is that it's it's all the time. It's not really controlled. It's uh, to the point where you even played forward this this season, right? When you went to, uh, what was it? I remember. I watched a game where he was he was at the forward positions, <laughs> but anyways, he's uh, it's not that that he's bad, but he has incredible vision. The, the guy is very good at seeing the plays, and he has the skill to execute on what he sees. So that is a skill that is amazing. Like in terms of offense, the what he can bring, it's really really good. But the thing is that right now the defense, and not just the defense, but the risk that he takes are not calculated in the way that. He always gets caught, and even though he's a good skater, he's not a great skater, so he can't really always recover from the mistakes that he does, and it, sometimes it doesn't even look like he wants to recover from the mistakes that he does. But outside of that, like the de the defense is is fine. It's like I said, it's more the risk that he takes, and even on the breakout, sometimes the passes that he will that that he does in the middle of the ice, and you're like, why did you do that? <laughs> there was two players, and he tried to put the puck through both their legs to get it to to send it to a player waiting at the blue line it's like maybe just don't do it because if it doesn't work if it doesn't work in the OHL it's certainly not going to work in the AHL or in the NHL so maybe just don't do that but outside of that like if there's a guy that you can bet take a bet on to be a good offensive defenseman and have a breakout season next year, I think it would be Henry Muse, even Alphonse Fry. Like I said, he's he's not as offensively gifted as Henry Muse, but he's an offensive defenseman for sure. Uh, he's, a, he's a much better skater, in my opinion. Alphonse Fry can really skate the puck. He's very good at skating the puck out cleanly and uh, transition the puck by himself. Uh, Henry Muse, not the same. He's, a, he's more of a passer than a skater. But like I said, both once once they enter the the offensive zone, they're both really good at walking the line. They're both really good at finding the pass the passing lanes and the shooting lanes. Uh, Henry Muse has pretty has some goals. Let me check. He has 15 goals, so he's, he's not a bad uh, a bad shooter at all. On the other hand, if I check Alphonse Fry, what is his point production? I should have noted it instead of just putting the page like that. Uh, same thing, but it's at the J20 National uh, in, in Sweden, which is a league that, again, it's a bit hard to evaluate what type of uh, of production is good and what's not good. Like, what's the level of the J20 National? It's not that great, <laughs> but it's okay. He still has 33 points, 14 goals in 40 games, so the production is there. For Sweden, he has 25 points in 19 overall international games, so the production is very much there and it is projection in terms of ranking like yeah there's some play, people who have him in the first round but most people have him in the second round so i think there's a there's a chance that he's there at, at 25th something like that but i think he's the type of player that might get picked a little bit earlier than that because like i said he brings a lot of offense but he's not as chaotic of a player as Henry Muse, he has good size at six foot one and one hundred and ninety two pounds or one hundred ninety five pounds, and he's also such an excellent skater that, like, if you have a player that's that's not big but has decent size, has that type of offensive uh, offensive mind, can skate like that, it's very attractive to uh, to, to to teams, right? Obviously, uh, yeah, so. That's it. <laughs> That's all I have to say about them. And this is basically where my first round kind of stops for me. There's still many players that I believe are first round talent that I'm sure won't be taken by the time we pick. Uh, like this player, like like I said, Misa or the Tanner Howe. Or the, they're an example of players that I think like deserve a spot with the, with our late first. But the problem is, like I said, is that I don't necessarily want other players that are 5'10". Even though they have great skills, like, I don't... There's not many more players that I want 5'10 that are good skater or whatever, unless they are extremely, extremely skilled. And this is not the case with either of them. It's not that they're It's not that they're not skilled. Like, obviously, I, I think I have Misa at number 19 in my uh, in my ranking that I made or something like that. So, obviously, I value the player that he is and I value the skills that he brings and the skating and all this stuff. 
And same thing, I have Tanner Hall in my first round too. I'm pretty sure that I had when I did it. And he, he deserved it. The fact that he kept the production that he had without Conor Bedard is a huge thing. It's, <laughs> it's, it's very good. But they are a smaller player. Even, like I said earlier, players like Lucas Pedersen or even Teddy Stigo is doing very, very well. He's creating so much uh, for the US NTDP. They're just... They're just the profile that I don't I don't want more on the team unless they had a significant skill and in that case it's not really like like I say you have Beckett Seneca or you have Lucas Peterson or Luke Misa like is is Misa a better player and a more productive player right now yeah I think so in my opinion at least he is. But is Beckett and a kid a better profile to make it to the NHL and uh, be a, a significant part of your team and the core of your team to go deep in the playoff and stuff like that? I think so too. So that's why I would take a player like that before I take a player like Misa or Tanner Hall, Lucas Peterson, and Teddy Stiga. So, oh yeah, <laughs> that's it. Uh, what else? Oh yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, true, true, true. One thing, if there's one player that is small and that I would like for the, the Habs to pick and it's just because it's like homerism if you want and it's also because the fact that he's just so dangerous it's uh, Justin Poirier for that place for the Dracar the guy has what is he now I think it's I checked like yesterday and he was at 47 goals in 63 games with like 75 points or something like around that and he ha- there's no there's no negative to his game like there's no holes in the way that he plays the, the hockey game the only hole is that he's minuscule he's like five foot eight and i think they're generous when they say five foot eight uh, <laughs> but i absolutely adore that player he's extremely competitive he's he's not a bad skater like if we compare to a, um i don't remember then what's his name when I'm put on the spot like, like that, sometimes I forget stuff. But then you, I'm sure you all know who's the guy from the QMJHL who was picked by Columbus, I think, in the third round, who everybody wanted because he was breaking records. <laughs> What's his name? Oh, my God. Anyways, I'm sure you guys know who it is. He's a smaller guy, but was not necessarily a great skater. But he's he was just breaking everything in the QMJHL. Well, it's a bit little... It's, it's a bit different with just Poirier in the sense that he's not a bad skater. He's even smaller, even less of a physical guy, even though he's not scared to be, he's not scared to go against bigger player and go to the board and go to the corner and go in front of the net and shoot the puck in, in traffic. It's what he does night after night. He's not scared of it, but a five foot eight player in the NHL, there's not many. There's not many that are successful and then they don't happen often. So obviously I would not never take that guy with the twenty five, with the twenty fifth pick, or a early, early second, because the risk is immense. But like, would I take that bet at the end of the second round or beginning of the third round? Ideally, I would take it with one of our pick in the, in the third round. But I would absolutely love the Habs to take him. I would love for the Habs to be the team that give him his chance to reach the NHL and work with him to get better and stuff like that. Because obviously you're not going to work with him to make him bigger. But you could make him better. But the guy, like I said, he has 47 goals in 63 games for the Dracar. I would love Justin Poirier, just for the story. <laughs> but outside of that, there's still some players that I would like to have. But those players are mostly players that I would that I would not take with the first round pick, that I would take with a second round pick if they were there. Obviously, I'm th- I think that some of the players that I've placed for my first round pick, I think some of them will be available for the second round pick because it's just the way that it is. Obviously, I GMs and teams they have such a big staff, they can see players everywhere around the world. They can go see them in in person. They can they have access to so much information that there's always players that comes a little bit out of nowhere and uh, like nobody saw him coming a bit like uh, Romanov when we picked him like nobody knew about Romanov but uh, we picked him very high in the second round because they looked at him they had their own combined stuff and they liked him and they were like okay so this happens like every draft so obviously some players will fall so if any of the players that I have named before are there 
uh, with our late with our late second, I would take any of those players before the next couple ones, and maybe even the players like I said, like L- Luke Misa and uh, all those smallish players. Maybe I would take them before I take those players too. But uh, that would be just a debate in my head. <laughs> but anyway, one of those players is Julius Miettinen. Miettinen. It's, 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 those <laughs> those Finnish names are not easy. <clears throat> anyway, six foot three, uh, six foot three forwards. Guy skates really well for a guy that's six foot three. Actually, he's not a he's not a great skater, but he's a good skater for that size. He has good hands. Uh, he's really good at beating people one on one and making them miss and make a like. How can I say that? Like, puts the puck out to to try to get defender to poke check him, and then he just moves the puck away so they're like. So he can skate by them while they have their arm extended and just out of position. Uh, he's really good at using his hands to make people miss and make plays out of it. Uh, he he's also he uses frame his skating and his hands to often just put the put the puck on his back end and drive to the net. Like you beat the defender out wide and you just cut to the net a la Josh Anderson. Without it doesn't have the same skating ability as Josh Anderson. Obviously not many can at that at that uh, at that size, but he does a little bit the same thing. Like the one move Josh Anderson is good at, uh, he can do it pretty well too. Uh, it's not a particularly great playmaker or shooter. So offensively like he's a guy that's gonna be able to be to do a little bit of everything on the ice. That will use his frame, will use his skating, will use his hands to make plays or open shots and stuff like that. But it's not like he has a great shot, and it's not like he's a great playmaker or anything like that. So he's not gonna be making tons of plays. He's a guy that's probably gonna be more in the bottom six. I I cannot see him play in the top six. I, I, obviously, everybody can get better at what they do, and then all of a sudden they explode. That's why every year there's. Uh, third round, fourth round, fifth round, sixth round, seventh round pick players who become very, very good players. And it's not because all the time because they were discriminated because they were small or something like that. It's sometimes we just miss. Like, <laughs> you just don't read the skill well or they just get better because development is not linear. Sometimes there's late bloomers, right? So it could happen with anybody. But what I'm saying is that if you take what Julius Metinen is right now, you cannot really see a player that's gonna be a top six player. It's not what it's looking like. Uh, another player that I would quite like to have is Marek Vanneker. He's a bit smaller and he's not a player that uh, plays heavy compared to most of them. Uh, but he he's a better skater than also most of them. But it's Marek Vanneker. Marek Vanneker, like I said, at six foot, he's a winger. Uh, he's not strong, like I said, but he competes well. Like he will go to the he will go to the board to get the get the puck. He's also because he's a good skater. He often wins his races, so he doesn't have to battle for it more. In the NHL, it's gonna be different though. Obviously, like the the com- not the competitive edge, but the the skating edge that you have when you when you play uh like in the CHL, it's not gonna be the same once you reach higher leagues. So it's gonna be different. But he uses a lot of um change in direction quick cuts change in speed to get to the middle of the eye so he competes well he's a good he's a good skater he has good hands like not great hands but he has good hands uh he has a good shot also like do i have his page somewhere do I, if i go here i open all kinds of page but now i don't know what's what yeah okay so i did open his page so in terms of stats, he has 34 goals, 34 goals and 77 points in 62 games. So like I said, he can produce offense. He has a good shot. He has decent hands. He uses skating a lot to push the pace or get to the middle with quick cuts and change in direction. So, yeah, I think there's something there. It's just like that. I guess that it's more like what he has right now. Will he keep it at the next level? That's the that's the part that I have a question for. Like some people, it's it's evident that what they have they will be an advantage once they reach higher level. With Marek Vanneker, it's it's more a question mark. So even though he's productive in the OHL, we'll see. But thirty four goals is the part that I like the most, and the skating is what I like the most too. It's the fact that he has a good shot, he gets into position to get those shots, and he has the skating to transition the puck and get into the open gaps. But outside of that, I don't think the hands and the playmaking is 
that much of a of an advantage but he does uh, beat defenders out wide a lot like a bit like I said with uh, Julius Mintinen the way they just he skates out wide but put the uh, the puck on his back end and cut to the net to get a sh- to get a shot from the inside and uh, he does that quite a lot also another player that I like uh, I like quite a lot actually it's Melvin Melvin Fernstrom and let me open his page uh, why so slow <laughs> anyway, it's not opening, but anyway, Melvin Fernstrom is a six foot one forward. Uh, he's a guy that's a bit more complete, like he's a two way type of guy. He's not just uh, offense or just defense. He can do, can do uh, both uh, both really well. One of my problem with him though is the skating. I think uh, it needs work. It's just okay. I don't think it's significantly under average, or I don't, I'm not even sure it's under average. It's just okay. <laughs> it's not going to be an advantage and it might be just a little bit of a disadvantage but other than that he's another player that is strong on the puck another player that plays heavy can shield the puck quite easily uh, obviously doing it at the J20 uh, national in Sweden level is much different but when you have when you have that body and you have the the, the competitiveness and the okay, so that, and you play strong on the puck you have that type of shot because he does have a good shot. Uh, you're gonna score goals when you play in a J20 national. So it's hard. To, it's hard to say. It's hard to say what it's gonna be because the production is is good. The uh, did it open? Yeah, it did open. So the production is 63 points, 31 goals, and in, in 45 games at the J20 national. So it is a gr- it is a good production. It's not a great production. It's like 1.4 points per game, something like that. So it's good. It's just not great. And look. If you guys want to be patient with me, I can just go look at something. I'm going to go in draft eligibility. I'm going to put draft eligible. And I'm going to put that at all time season. And we're going to filter out by point per game. I'm going to go look what it is. What did I say? I said it was 1.4 1. or something like that. Um, Where is he? Melvin Fernstrom. All right, so oh, I was right on it. So 63 points in 45 games is exactly 1.4. Uh, players that are comparable in that range are players like Emil Einemann, which uh, I think Emil Einemann is a better skater. But uh, in terms of shot, I would say I think Fernstrom has a better shot than, than he has, but uh, it's, it's hard to say. It's hard to say. Uh, Lars Eller, William Carlson are players that were there. Uh, is there other player not too far? This Albin Gru was drafted a couple years ago. Mm, Jesper Fast, Noah Huslund, Huslund, Uslund, Uslund. <laughs> we're all players that are, that were uh, <clears throat> that in that type of range. There's Lucas Pedersen, the players that I said that I like quite a lot, but that is more on the smaller side and a frail type of frame. <laughs> but he has a he's at 1.30 point per game instead of uh 1.40. So production is not as good. But anyway, the main point is that there are NHL players in that type of range of production at the J20 level. So it's not like it's unheard of or something like that. And when you take the fact that he's he's strong, he plays heavy and he has a great shot. Um and he's also played very well defensively. Like he has a good two-way game. I think it's like there's a good chance that that player will play. At, like at what level? Probably bottom six. I don't think it's the type of player that will become a top six. But there's always a chance. Like I said, it's just the fact that he has a lot of what it takes to make it to the NHL. Except for the skating. Like I said, that could be a little bit of an under-average uh, type of skill. All right, and the last one, the last player for today is Eric Smateko. <laughs> and honestly, it's not like I watched him a ton. It's and that I or that I love him a ton is I saw him live. I think it was at the beginning of the season. Was it? I think so. Yeah, I I think so. I think it's at the beginning of the season because so I don't think anyway he played uh, in my in my in my region. Uh, Anyway, anyway, <laughs> forget it. I saw him live, and I think it's at the beginning at the beginning of the season. Uh, the thing is, Mateko is giant. He's six foot four, and 
at least live, like I I saw only I think two other games of him, so I don't have a big like I don't have a lot of clips on him. I don't have like a lot of views on him, so it's hard to say. But live, he looked like he flies. <laughs> live, he flies. But uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I saw the same thing when I look when I saw him on video. So it's different. You know, the skating is just different when you see it live and when you see it on video. So when you compare from video to video, I would say that Eric Smateko is probably not a great skater, it would be an average skater at best, but when I saw him live, I thought like he was one of the best player and one of the fastest player. He was he had a long stride and he had like um like the the stride is slow because he was so big and he like long legs, but he was flying. He was beating people wide all the time. So, I mean, if you can do it, it's cuz you can skate well, usually. Unless the defenders can't skate, so <laughs> there's that. Uh, and outside of that, the production is not necessarily great, but it's fine. It's 42 points in 47 games, 22 goals. So he can make things happen, but he's not the main creator. He's not necessarily a great shooter. He's not a great playmaker, but he has good puck protection. He's like, uh, I would say, like, his ceiling. <laughs> so. <laughs> his ceiling is like Armia when he sleeps. <laughs> so, so like, don't take what I'm saying seriously in the sense that I want him as my second round, <laughs> as my second round player or something like that. I don't think I really want him as my second round player. It's just that when I saw him, I was like a bit surprised by how he looked and how good he was and how he f fly when he w compared to everybody else on the ice. And he he had decent hands and he was decent shooter and he was making plays uh, off the rush and also once they were established so he was doing good maybe it was just that game because the two other games that I saw it was nothing uh, nothing was great it's more play I would take in my I would take him more in my third round or fourth round than my second round but like I said I like the profile and I like what I saw when I saw him live but after that what I saw not live was not the same so <laughs> so we'll see but anyway that was the last player for the um, for this podcast obviously there's there's all kinds of other player that I, that I would like to have in my first round or my second round but there are players that like they fall somewhere in between our picks because because we have a late pick in the in the first round with Winnipeg and our second round pick is is it Colorado? I think it's Colorado this year, right? We don't have our own because we gave it away for for Dvorak. <laughs> but, but but yeah, I think we I think it's Colorado. I don't have it in front of me on cat friendly, but it doesn't matter. I think that's what it is. So it's gonna be most likely further down the road. So there's players like I think like Raul Boilard or even players like Dean Le Tourneau or Ryder Ritchie that I, I feel like they go somewhere in between the 25th pick and probably like the 64th pick, right? So, like Dean Litorno, I, I I saw a lot of his games because uh, I didn't know him before. Who brought it up to me? I was an elite prospect. When I saw him on the ranking of elite prospect and I watched their discussions and stuff, I went to look for his games and... Uh, I think he's okay, <laughs> but that's it. I think it's more like the the body profile that's making uh, people uh, like love him a bit too much, probably. But at the same time, look, we'll see. People of that size, they will always get a chance to get to the NHL because it's not just the size, but it's also the fact that he can shoot the puck hard and he can he can skate quite well. So if you have that type of profile, you will get a chance to get to the NHL and show what you can do. Uh, but I'm not convinced by what it is, but like I said, I would not take him with my 25th pick, but if I had like an early second, like uh, let's say I had a 40th pick, I would take him with the 40th pick because I feel like the the risk reward is adequate. I don't think it's adequate in the first round. Maybe if you're picking 32nd or something like that, but you know, uh, outside of that other player like Raul Boilard, I'm not his biggest fan, but I understand the type of player he is and I understand what he brings to a team, but I'm not sure he has the skills to uh, be like a 25th pick. But at the same time, I think he's too good to fall to 64th. So 
again, it's just <laughs> I can't really. I, it's a player that I don't think he is gonna be there. And same thing with Ryder Ritchie. It's another player that, but Ryder Ritchie, I liked him a lot at the beginning of the season. It's just it's getting harder and harder to see what Ryder Ritchie, what Ryder Ritchie, Ritchie, Ritchie will be at the NHL level. Like, what's his role? What 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 does he bring? He doesn't bring a ton of production. He brings a ton of skill. He brings he brings space. He brings all kinds of stuff. But he's not a big guy. He's not a guy that plays heavy. He's he's not a guy that do all kinds of things that are positive. So I think it's just gonna be, uh, like I said, it's a guy that will probably drop to the second round. But I don't think it's the type of player that I would pick if I. Even at 64th, like at 64th, I would take him obviously because his skills is obviously good enough for it. But before that, I'm not sure because even though he has the skills, I'm not sure the the overall package is that attractive anymore unless he starts making some things real quick. Anyway, uh, other than that, uh, there was other some, there was other players, but I feel like with the amount the limited amount of views. Uh, I didn't like too much. Like, there's players like Cole Baldwin or Simons either. I just don't like. And again, it's a, it's a it's a thing about this skating. Like, I try not to include too many players that are not necessarily bad skater, but under average skater because I think it's such a defining factor of if you if you're gonna make it to the NHL or not. Like, to make it to the NHL without being at least an average skater, you have to have some kind of brain, some kind of understanding how to create or how to defend or something like that. And like Cobalt Wayne and Simon Zither, it's difficult. And I'm not sure they have, even though they have the competitiveness, unless it gets like significantly better, I don't think they are players that are really, that will bring much. Like maybe they make it to the NHL, but will they bring a lot? I don't know. I don't think so. And there's other players who are who have problems with skating. Like I said, like uh, Maxim Mossy, who I have in my ranking, but it's just that he has he has some skills like his shot that are a difference maker. Like he like if he brings if he brings his skating to a, another level, then the the shot will start working and he will bring a lot of offense. You can't say the same for Cole Baldwin or Simon Zither. If, if, even if they fix their skating, what do they bring? They bring competitiveness. They bring some two-way play. So it's not bad, but I'd rather have Max and Mossy. <laughs> All right? So I think that's about it for today. Uh, I have no clue how much time it take. I don't even have a timer on this recording thing. Oh, well. Anyway, it is what it is. So I hope you guys enjoyed. Obviously, I'm keeping some players for later like obviously at some point i'm gonna do a podcast or a video about hidden gems or players that i like a lot that go further down the draft but like i have to keep some content for later <laughs> so i can't talk about every single player but at the same time i thought it, it was nice to just go over the players that i think we should target with our later picks and but not later later but our late first and late second pick and uh yeah, that's it. So I hope you enjoyed. And uh, that's it. Have a good one. See you in the next one. Peace.